I remember I used to think, I don't know how to make money unless it's haram or illegal. Holidays, Dubai, Los Angeles, New York, shopping, clothes, friends. I have what a young man coming from that background one. But when I left, I just wasn't happy though. One brother comes up to me. It was me, you look very sad. So I got some bad news though. You're going to be depressed forever. What do you mean? I actually understood at that point why people take drugs. I swear about that. Every umrah to umrah, I feel my back balance goes up. Like monthly income, that like quadrupled. What people don't deep though, is that it won't happen overnight. What you find is that Allah is testing you. He's building your character. If you're patient, for long enough throughout the process, you will find uh, blessings. I have crazy dreams, bro. Make dua to Allah whilst you're certain he's going to respond. I'm certain, Ak. I'm going to help 1,000 brothers become millionaires, inshallah ta'ala. Record this. Ask me in 10 years. Why everyone looked at Andrew Tate and became happy when he became Muslim? Because the most famous man in the world said, Allah first. Iman, salam alaikum and welcome to the CEO class, my brother. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Appreciate you jumping pleasure on, bro. Pleasure to be here with you, my bro. Pleasure to have you on, bro. So, <laughs> it's been a long time since we've been trying to organize this. And here we are finally in the coming eight days, the end of my trip. We are finally here to make it happen. So, I appreciate you joining me on. No, I appreciate that, bro. People are seeing the topi, people are seeing the juba right now thinking, who is this man coming on the pod podcast? <laughs> so, introduce yourself, my bro. Bro, um, yeah, so my name is Imran. Um, Currently, alhamdulillah, what I do is I uh, help Muslims set up businesses. Um, my aim, inshallah, out of the next 10 years, I'm trying to help, with Allah's permission, 1,000 Muslim millionaires come about, inshallah. Um, that's a big statement right there. Yeah, that's the plan, alhamdulillah. Inshallah. We already got a couple brothers, we've taken them six figures, couple companies, couple businesses. Yeah. Plan in the next 10 years, though, 1,000 millionaires. Um, I started off about 12, 13 years ago on social media with da'wah. My thing was I wanted to give people a flavor of this beautiful religion. Me, myself, I came from a background of darkness. Um, I was involved in music heavily. A couple of people that ended up becoming quite famous. They recorded their first mixtapes in my studio. So in the music scene, kind of had a foot in there. But I felt very empty. So I had what most people would have, you know, access to women, access to money, access to respect, status, but it won't really bring me much happiness. So yeah. I just found that sweetness in this deen, knowing that I have a Lord that loves me and that's always going to be there for me. Not, it's not going to let me down. So I wanted to share that with people. So the last 10 years I spent giving da'wah and um, you know, just calling people back to Allah, just sharing with them what I found. And currently I wanted to just, you know, I spent a lot of time focusing on the guys in the streets. So we had a huge kind of, um, yeah, huge... Huge effort with, with guys that were involved in gang crime, knife crime. I'm sure you remember a couple of years ago, the murder rate in London was above New York. Yeah. So I really was just focusing on those guys. Now, currently, my I'm still doing the data side of things, but my focus is now more on businessmen. So I'm focusing on entrepreneurs, C-suite executives, those type of people. You know what, alhamdulillah, you, you definitely made an impact um, for people like myself and people in the ends mm -hmm. when it comes to Dawa. You know, a lot of people message me. A lot of people are requesting you to, to come on. Mm -hmm. But take this any way you, you will. Um, mm -hmm. Not in a bad way, anything like that. Obviously, your name on socials and stuff, you go by Imran now. But a lot of people are saying, bro, you need to get Dawah Man on, get Dawah Man on, get Dawah Man on. I'm like, cool, inshallah, we'll get him on and stuff. So mm -hmm. when people are saying that and they're making that request, to me, it's like you made such a big impact on helping people with their deen. How do you feel about that? Knowing that people from the ends, just like our own environments growing up, are now having a realization and a moment of reflection to be like, okay, look, Imran said this, Dawman has said this, I need to implement this and change my life. I just feel grateful to Allah, man, because He could use anyone. Allah could use anyone for this message, right? Mm. The fact that He chose me. Allah's going to make His word spread regardless. But it's just a privilege that my Lord chose me. I just hope it's accepted. Yeah. Do you know what's funny? Yeah. I went to a Light Upon Light event mm. not too long ago. I think it was in January, maybe, I believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it was with Mufti Menk mm -hmm. and Ahi Eamon, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Ahi Eamon, very good brother of mine. Mm -hmm. And Mufti said it on the stage, right? He said this, he was like, after this, this is after Ahi Eamon have just come off stage and Mufti was like, it's, it's funny how Allah uses people in a way to spread dawah. Mm. You know, and looking at Ahi Eamon's past mm. and looking at Ahi Eamon's come up on socials, mm -hmm. essentially, he's gone from that man who's sharing his story or being on road and everything mm. to turn into Allah to now being a very globally recognized man mm. in a sense of giving out dawah. Mm. Videos galore all over him on TikTok, all over Instagram. Mm -hmm. And Mufti couldn't have said it any better, the fact that 
Allah's using this man to spread the message of Islam. And mm. I thought that's such a beautiful thing. Mm. And when I saw Akim and after, and I was like, bro, alhamdulillah for what you do, man. Because mm. I think in times like that, we don't recognize it ourselves and, and the impact that we're doing and mm. the impact that we're leaving. Um, but it's only until people then say it after, mm. which is incredible. You mentioned there, you know, about your upbringing and being heavily involved in music and stuff like that. So let's now go all the way back mm. to your younger days, childhood days. Tell mm. me about where you were growing up your upbringing, how it was like for you, the man you were back then. And you know what's it. funny? Is that I had the I had the most beautiful upbringing. I had both my parents were there. I come from a Pakistani household. You know, being Pakistani stuff, you know, like parents, they care for you, look out for you, want you to be educated. I, I got shown the love. I got shown all of that. But I ended up in a bad place. I ended up hanging around with people on the streets. I ended up carrying a knife. What and age is this? This is like 14, 13 Upwards Ended because up getting involved in music So just into your teens then Yeah Like as in I'm not mentioning this In any way shape or form For like In terms of glorification I actually find it to be something That's a bit cringe But like How I went from being a place a Guy who came from a good household To now I've got a gun mm. Do you understand So For me I which, was like Which area did you grow up in as well? That's what I'm saying I, I, As in I, I'm from Hounslow Okay yeah So Hounslow Yeah the area was bad At the time It was the The, the, the worst borough In the whole of London, back when I back back when I was a teenager, they had this. Without getting into it, but I wasn't involved in any of that stuff. What messed me up was I had a cousin, seven years old. I must have gone to his house. I remember my dad used to always say to me, "Don't hang around with your cousins. He used to keep me away from them." And my man used to say, "Dad, these cousins are cool. What's the, like, I'm looking up to my older cousins, yeah, right?" As family, you would. Yeah. When you don't have a much of an understanding yeah. of life, then. But it was only years later I realized my dad had wisdom or life. So my cousin. He took me to his room and he got, introduced me to all these all these rap albums. How old is he then? So he's he's three years older than me. Okay. So, so imagine if I'm seven, he's ten. Ten. Okay. Um and he's introducing me to MMM, uh, Eminem, right? The Marshall Matters and this, that, Tupac, NWA, Dr. Dre, DMX, all of this stuff. And I mean, put Dean to a side. Even the non-Muslims would tell you parental advisory. Like kids are not supposed to be listening to this stuff. Mm. Right? Yeah, 100%. Kids are not supposed to be listening to this stuff. Yeah. When you turn the music on straight where you're hearing about I, kill, I killed him, I murdered him, I'm going to do this, I'm going to shoot him up. That stuff pollutes your mind. Right? And what people don't realize is that the ears and the eyes are the gateway to the heart. So what I look at and what I see is going to impact me. So as a seven-year-old, I'm like, what? This is good. This is nice. I'm just listening, listening, listening. Bro, I remember Eminem had this one song where he's, he's talking about killing his mum, right? He's talking about killing his mum. And he's, he's calling his mum the B word. He's calling him all of this stuff. So imagine now, I'm listening to this. Cleaning up my closet? I'm trying no, to think no, of the song. This, this, this is in the first. I don't want to mention it because I don't want people to go listen to it. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, I tell, if I, I mention it, bleep it. Okay. It's called Okay, I haven't heard that one. Like imagine that. he's got, that's the song and he's talking about his mum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember, Akhim, Allah forgive me. I mean, I'm Pakistan now. I, I'm, a Pakistani kid, I, I eat curry, that's what I do. But I'm in Pakistan now, I'm in Pearl Continental Hotel in Lahore. I'm not sure if you're familiar, yeah? No. So I'm there, and I've got my headphones, I've got my Sony Walkman, and I'm listening to this song. And I'm hearing a guy talking about, I'm hearing a guy talking about, you know, I'm going to kill you, mom, and you're B-I-T-C-H. And my mom's right there. My mom's t- calling me, but now I've lost respect for her. Because imagine, I'm hearing a guy, a grown Influenced man. Influenced by the song. Yeah, so it's like, I remember, he, I wasn't able to respect my mom. I started to become violent. I started to become aggressive. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my temper. I'm hanging out with guys that were that are from Brixton, that are from, you know, the ends, right? If people know those type of areas back in the days, Angel Town, that's where it, where it got cracking. So I have got no business being in this environment, but mm. I'm in it now. Mm. And now I'm doing my own music. And then I realized, okay, there's no money in the music. You started rapping yourself and I started stuff? I started rapping myself. Yep. So... How long is this after now? How uh, 16. I, I, I started writing rhymes when I was like 14, 13, but I started taking it seriously when I was like 16. Then I said, okay, cool. Kind of had a bit of a business mind as well. You mentioned earlier you were selling sweets. I used to also sell sweets at my locker. I just had that little entrepreneurial spirit. I said, people don't really make money as a musician. They make money doing the stuff behind the scenes. So I said, okay, let me set up a studio. So at the age of 18, I had my own studio set up and I was marketing in it as well. And a bunch of guys, I won't mention their names, but people that ended up blowing and becoming massive. Can you mention them? I'll bleep it. Like. Yeah, like... You had on a podcast, he recorded his first ever mixtape in my studio. Um, Allah forgive me, I don't mention this to like... 
Well, I'm embarrassed of it. But no, do you know what? Is it, oh, just a, sorry to interrupt mm. you. Here. It's not a thought because I know you know there's a saying of don't expose your sins mm. in glorification. But I think mm. it's a it's a good way to understand, yeah. especially for the audience watching, the life you've come from. Mm. And inshallah, we're gonna go into the yeah, podcast yeah. to talk about where you are now. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah, I only mentioned to be able to relate and just so people can so yeah. people can see the journey. So point being is that, but that that I ended up in that path, and like I said, Akhi, I had no business. But it just to me what it shows me, and maybe hopefully the the, the lesson I can I can help share people with this. Well, like, is the danger of of a couple of, of of who you surround yourself with. Like I wasn't I didn't surround myself with drug dealers or gangsters. Uh, originally, I didn't start off with that. Nowadays, people don't surround themselves with certain type of people. But who you see online, who you subscribe to, who you follow on social media, who you listen to, that is all influencing you. Like sometimes. Who you're subscribed to on YouTube is more dangerous than the guy that you actually spend time with. Because even the guy who's a criminal that you spend time with might be a couple of hours in a day. But online, you're just listening to these people and they're just polluting your mind. And some people may not be able to relate if they don't come from the streets. But it could be ideologies. It could be it could be like you're always hearing talk, people talking about women. Then you just become obsessed with women. You're always hearing people talk about material things like the material life, material world. You just become obsessed with material things. So you have to really safeguard your eyes or ears. But specifically music. I'll tell you something, Raheem, bro. Check this. You know I'm not sure if you're familiar, but... This episode is sponsored by Fireway Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK. With over 100 locations, you definitely have a store near you. The founder of Fireway was on the show not too long ago, and you can get a slice of the action by using the discount code CEOCAST at fireway.co.uk. Once again, use the discount code CEOCAST at fireway.co.uk. When the Quran was being revealed, Allah was sending the legislation down to the Prophet ﷺ. It was split into two parts, the period in Mecca and the period in Medina. Many people may not be familiar, but there's a difference between what was coming down in Mecca and Medina. In Mecca, there was hardly any rules. Like, there was hardly any haram. It was, let's teach you about Allah. In Mecca, it was all about who is Allah? What does he do? What does he love? What does he not love? How great is he? What are his names? What are his attributes? Look at what he's given you. Look at the mercies that he's given you. Look at his strength. Look at his power. And also, day of judgment. And stories of the prophets that came before. So, it was information. But there was no rulings. There was, but very few. Medina now, there's rulings. Don't eat pig. Even though that was from before. But okay, don't do riba. Don't engage in interest. Don't gamble. Don't drink alcohol. Alcohol wasn't even made haram in, in Mecca. Yeah. There was Sahaba who drink alcohol. Right? There was, there was Sahaba, Prophet's companions that would drink alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah, Mecca. Yeah. It became haram afterwards. The reason why is because at the beginning, people are being nurtured. On Iman They're being nurtured on Who is Allah Imagine Like sometimes Like youngers would come up to me And at, in the masjid Like for example I could smell weed off them I would not even mention it to them Sometimes they come up to me And I know he's got a knife on him Sometimes I come At the end of the lecture They would come They would give me a hug And I just felt What well, I'm pretty sure is a knife bro A big zombie killer That he's got in, tucked mm. inside right here I, I will never In a first conversation Talk to any of these brothers About Um the, the 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 drugs or the, the this or that you know what? because I I don't even know if he's got faith right now I don't even know if he if he if he firmly no I know he's got faith but I don't know how solid his faith is mm. because if 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 he firmly believes in Allah and believes in the day of judgment then he's gonna leave off everything but the issue is that that iman isn't solidly there right so at the beginning you just build people on iman so I'll just talk to them all day about every day about Allah how great he is the day of judgment the grave this is for socials and everything like that. Even on the socials. Like even on socials. If someone asks me, ah, what's the ruling on this? Is this is gambling allowed? I would say no, because Allah mentioned clearly in the Quran, it's not, but off the bat, I don't bring that up. Yeah. I don't bring that up with them, right? Even if I see a guy, like sometimes guys pull up on me and, and he's got his girl there. I know he's embarrassed, but I don't want to make him feel any more embarrassed than he already is. And that's irrelevant to me. My thing is, bro, let's pray. Start praying. Get to know Allah. Eventually, you're going to marry her, or you're going to leave, or you're going to leave her for the sake of Allah, and you're going to you're going to come correct. Mm -hmm. So, in Mecca, it was more about let's build their hearts and connect them to Allah. In Medina, let's tell them what's right, what's what's wrong, what's wrong. Okay, but there's 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 something unique now. Music wasn't like that though. Music is haram, right? But it was it, Allah didn't wait till Medina to tell people music's haram. Allah told them in Mecca straight away. In fact, Allah told them right at the beginning, Surah Luqman, Ayah number six. Uh, which is um, in the Quran, Allah Azza wa referred to music as uh, a hadith, a very nasty speech, uh, something that Allah says misguides you from the path of Allah. Now the question is why though? 
Why did music at the beginning, like Allah is, Allah is telling you, alcohol, he's not even telling you stop drinking that yet. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. gonna but come. music was the first thing. First thing. Yeah. Or one of the first, why? You told because me. Because like, music is the one thing if it gets in your heart, it'll be hard for the Quran to get in your heart. Music is the, is the, is the, is the speech of shaitan. The Quran is the speech of Allah. And it's only, the heart's only going to be able to take one of them. So yeah. that's what like, music is, is bad, man. I've had conversations with brothers where it's like, where they say it's very, very hard, near enough impossible to be listening to music and have the Quran in your mm. heart as well. It's very hard to become a hafiz, for example, mm. if you're still listening to mm. music at the same time. And it's funny because I remember you saying that on, uh, you posted an Instagram reel not too long ago, to mm. be fair. And that kind of blew up. I saw it on all of my friends' socials mm. and all that sort of stuff. Everyone posting in their story. And I didn't actually know that then. Mm. The fact that music was banned before mm. alcohol mm. even existed, which was crazy uh, to see, man. And, al- and, al- see. and look, alcohol make you murder a man. Alcohol make you sleep with another man's wife. Mm. Alcohol make you do crazy things. But the si- alcohol is an intoxicant, so is music. Music will do the same thing. In fact, you know what? Even if you, put, even if you don't look at it from the Dean angle, uh, mu- mu- there's studies that show music will make your testosterone drop. Mm. Really? And yeah, music will show you, t- make your testosterone drop. Now, it's no wonder where now you've got rappers that are moving soft. You've got rappers like, that are doing, pretending to do strip dance, a lap dance on, on shaitan. you got rappers oh, that yeah, now yeah. promoting themselves with a pregnant belly. Yeah. Now you've got gangster rappers that wearing dresses. What the hell is it? <laughs> but I reckon this, but at the same time, that all comes down to a conversation we're going to have later on, mm. which is about selling your soul, mm. right? So that, I reckon, obviously that's down to music, mm. but also down to the deeper involvement mm. with Shaitan as well at the same time. Yeah, 100. But just going back to your past life, right? Obviously, Alhamdulillah, right now you're heavily indulged into Islam. What about your household? What was it like then? It was just a lazy Pakistani household. It was a good household, good culture, people like Madrasa. But par- parents on Deen and stuff like that? Yeah, like average. Alhamdulillah, it's good. Now now they're even more so. But it was it was just a nice... I, I, I had no reason... To not be patterned. Mm-hmm. Do you get me? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was just, just music got into my head and now I think I'm Tupac. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what he used to call me at school? He used to call me Tupac-y. <laughs> it's Tupac-y, you know. That would make sense. That's the typical one right there. <laughs> that was the typical one. Where did your life go from there? So now I'm like 19, 20. I'm like 20 now. And like I said, now I'm got these rappers that are friends. And not only that, like I actually had guys that were on the streets that my boys who are not in the limelight, not in the public, but they do whatever they do there. And to you, as in coming from that background, this is, bro, you've got, this is networking. Now today you want to be connected to, you know, like a student knowledge connected to scholars, this sheikh, that sheikh, or businessman, I'm connected to this venture capitalist, that CEO, you know what I'm saying? For us, it was this, do you understand? So my network is as good as it can be. Not only that I've got money coming in, I've got a business. These girls... They want to spend, they, they, they are attracted to me or whatever have you. I have what a young man coming from that background would want. Yeah. But what I know, I just boy, wasn't happy though. It's weird. I just, I'm very, 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 very depressed. Did you know the root of it though? No, I didn't. Unhappiness. No, I, I didn't. I didn't. And I just kept thinking, okay, I'm going to do this and I'll get happy. I'll do this and I'll get happy. And what was you doing to get happy? I don't know, just holidays, Dubai, Los Angeles, New York, shopping, clothes, friends. Just whatever. Alhamdulillah, I never did drugs, never did alcohol, alhamdulillah. And Allah protected me from a lot of things. I never went clubbing, never went raving. That was never my thing. I just, alhamdulillah, never, 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 never even into that. But you know, just, you're just, you're trying to find some type of joy. Now, at the same time, I'm in uni, right? So, which uni did you go? I went to Greenwich. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm, yeah, so I'm in uni now. And I just one day I was like, let me just go to the prayer room. So I went to the prayer room. Just on a random wind. Just a random one. Just, uh, just went to the prayer room, prayed Salah, and now I'm just sitting there looking. Just, and if you saw me, you just think, What's, why is my man upset? One brother comes up to me. He goes, you look very sad. You look depressed. Like, what's going on? So I said, yeah. At that time, I said, you know what? Let me just open up to him. Let me just... Let Stranger. Me, yeah, let me, let me just open up to this brother. I don't know what it was. He made me feel comfortable. So I went for my life. I said, bro, I've got this girl. I love her. Hopefully she'll be my wife. Everything I'll be looking for. Then at the same time, bro, I've got this, I've got that. But I just, I don't know, man, I just feel sad. He goes, man, I know what your problem is. So I got some bad news, though. He said, you're going to be depressed forever. I said, what? What do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> at that, you know when he said that to me? I actually understood at that point why people take drugs. 
I understood why you could be this big rapper, you could be this big businessman, you got all this money, but why you have to drink alcohol? To escape the reality of your sadness. Mm. Like, with all of that, it won't actually give you internal peace. No, no, of course not. It won't. No. So at that moment, I actually said, okay. And then, and then, and then quickly my mind understood why some people kill themselves. Because even after that, even after when that buzz leaves, you come back to your reality. So if you keep upgrading the drugs, or if I have to end your life. So when he said That's that- It's mad when you say it like that. Yeah. So when he said that to me, I said, bro, what do you, what do you mean? Like, how, why, how, why am I always gonna be depressed? He said, bro, as long as you place your happiness in things that are temporary, your happiness is temporary. He said, the reason why you like this girl, but she causes you pain, is because she's imperfect. And if you place your happiness in her, whenever she's about and she's patterned, you're happy. But when she's not, you're sad. If you place your happiness in a Ferrari, your happiness will be there as long as the Ferrari is there. But when the Ferrari goes, so does your happiness. If you place your happiness in your boys, your happiness is there as long as your boys are there. But when your boys go, so does your happiness. So at that point, I'm like, okay, this is this, this peak then. He said, but there's one way to be happy. I said, what's that? He said, place your happiness in the one that's always there. The one that never goes. At night when everyone's abandoned you, everyone's left you. He's still there. I said, who's that? He said, Allah. I, that, that, when he said that to me, that changed my life. And I made a commitment that day that I'm going to fall in love with Allah. Bro, just gonna, you, just gonna, you saying that right now just hit me as well. Like When you put it like that, that's crazy, mm-hmm. bro. Yeah, bro. I just, I, that day, I just, I, I've seen a lot in life, bro. I've seen... I, I, bro, people break your heart, bro. I've seen parents. Parents are the ones that love you the most, right? I've seen multiple times situations where parents will cause their child pain. Like we hear about, we hear about it all the time, right? Parents that love you, but they put you through stress because they want you to be successful. But in the process, they're causing you so much pain. Sometimes you're married and you've got a wife, but your mom's creating problems with your wife. But you think, my mom's causing me pain. And that's your mom. Like she's the one that really loves you more than anyone else. Like if push comes out, your mom loves you more than your wife, but your mom causes you pain, Right? And parents don't intend to. If a parent can cause their child pain, anyone can cause you pain. Do you understand? So, well, I mean, I've seen it all. I've seen a lot. But like, alhamdulillah, I've got some loyal friends. I've got a loyal team. You know, I've got lovely parents. But I, I'm not going to fool myself, bro. I'm going to go into my grave alone. I'm, I'm going to stand before Allah. When the people stand before their Lord, it's going to be me and Allah, bro. So I might as well, so I'm not so I'm not estranged from my Lord on that day. I'm be connected to him today. Because if I'm not connected to him today, I'm a stranger to him that day. That's what it is. At that point in there, did your life flip, I suppose, right side up then? Was that almost a reflection point to think, I need to fix up, I need to get rid of this, I need to do all these sort of things and be on my dean. So at the time it's, well, you know what's crazy? Is that I wasn't even thinking about the sins. So I wasn't thinking that I should stop talking to females. I wasn't thinking I should leave off music. I wasn't even thinking that. I was just like, okay, cool, 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 cool. So I need to learn about Allah because you can't love someone you don't know. And number two, I need to have a relationship with him, right? So the relationship with Allah is Salah. Salah in Arabic comes from the word Sila, which means connection. You know, like this, uh, the phone line, etisalat. <laughs> etisalat, it means connection. Okay. So it comes from the same word. Yeah. Sila, connection. So salah is connection between you and Allah. So I say, okay, cool. So I'm going to start praying. And I'm going to start learning about Allah. Because every time I would learn about Allah, it would just, it would do, it would just increase my iman. And I'm like, oh, that's my Lord. Okay. He forgives the sins. Oh, okay. He's watching me right now. Even when I'm sleeping, he's watching me. <sighs> okay. Every time I learn about Allah, it makes me feel good. And then, Every time I'm learning, my salah is getting better. I had no intention to stop talking to females. I had no intention to stop listening to music. I just walked into the studio one day and my business partner that was with me, he helped me set up the studio. I just looked at him. I said, bro, this place is evil. So I've got a headache just being here. As soon as I walked was in. Was he Muslim or? He's Muslim, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I said, I just, yeah, I've got a headache just being here, bro. I just looked at him and said, I'm going to close this place down. He was like, yeah, cool. I just shut off the studio. But I never, th- I never thought, let me stop listening to music. But I'm praying, praying, I'm going to the masjid, praying. 
Six months pass. I've stopped talking to women. I haven't listened to music. I actually remember six months passed and I looked in the mirror. I said, bro, you haven't listened to music. What's going on? And it was only years later. I came across this ayah in the Quran where Allah said, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Allah said, the prayer, it prohibits you from sins. When you pray, automatically the prayer pushes you towards good. The prayer protects you. The prayer says to you, it's like prohibit, like it says to you, no, you're not doing this today. Because as your iman, as your, as your heart is being filled with the love of Allah and his belief in Allah, it wants more of that which is pleasing to Allah. It wants to connect to Allah. And it doesn't want the things that displease Allah. It's, it's the fitrah, it's the soul. It's, it's, it's naturally Allah made this system inside yeah, of you. Yeah. So The soul is now content. Right. So then, and that's why I always tell brothers, I say, look, you've got to leave the sin. But don't focus on just leaving the sin. Also focus on building the heart, good deeds. That's why in Ramadan, uh, we don't realize, why is it that it's so much easier to do good deeds? Because shaitan locked up. <laughs> that's one. But it's also another. Go on. You're doing good deeds. When you do good deeds, your iman increases. You know, fasting, this is, the, this is the pillar of Islam. Fasting in these 29, 30 days, is such a great act of worship. The Prophet said, it distances your face from the fire 70 years. One day of fasting will distance your face from the fire 70 years. This is massive. Like fasting, Allah said, Allah said, fasting is for me and I will reward you without mentioning a number. I said, Allah will just give you, and give you, give you. There's no, that when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you do a particular action, you might be told, here's the reward. Fasting, there's no number. It's a limitless reward. So this is a massive good deed. So when you fasted one day, and now your heart is getting close to Allah. It wants to do good. So that's why you say, okay, let me go pray taraweeh at night. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Now I pray taraweeh at night. I fasted in the day and I prayed at night. The next day, I want to do more good. Especially when I'm fasting again and I'm praying at night. And I'm, and I'm praying. That's, so I'm actually strengthening my heart. So yeah, one side is shaitan is locked up. So it's easier to not do the sin. But at the same time, I'm getting stronger in terms of my faith. The problem is, what we do is that as soon as Ramadan finishes and Eid kicks in, everyone loses focus and they give into shaitan straight away. So he just gets a little capture of the heart. But if only we realize just, uh, it's not just stay away from the sin, but it's also carry on doing the good deeds. Yeah, you have to. You have to keep the habit of what you built in Ramadan yeah. and keep it outside of Ramadan as well. And uh, do you know what? It's, it's mad as well because I don't even want to expose too much about what I'm about to say. May cut it out the podcast. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I remember... Like you have one month for the whole 12 months to build a solid, solid connection with Allah, build a solid with the connection of the Quran. And then to do that after, to me, I always saw that as that is wild. Mm. And I'm sure there's probably a load of people around the world who may do the same sort of thing as well. It's sad because, you know, for, like Eid is actually a celebration. People don't even realize what we're we celebrating. If you ask me, what are you celebrating? Like, what is the celebration? The celebration is that we did good deeds. Mm. That got us to a point where we are now guided and our Iman is high. As in, we're celebrating the fact that we done something that's gonna get us to Jannah now. Yeah. So does it make sense that you celebrate with things that are actions of the hellfire? Yeah, it don't make no sense. It makes no sense. I used to just think all the time, yep, shaitan's back in action. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Chain, chains are unreal. Well, you can tell. Man, like, man, literally, man, oh, literally. Like you can tell. Well, you can actually tell, you can actually tell, and you can feel it in your heart. Yeah. You can genuinely feel it. The, when the shaitan's not here mm. Because you just feel This closer connection With Allah mm. All these Sins that you may commit On a day to day basis Knowingly or unknowingly You realise in Ramadan I'm not, I'm not feeling that, that sin Or anything mm. like that If you know what I mean I don't have to make it Make sense but I'm sure you probably Understand exactly <laughs> no, what no, I'm saying you're, 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 it's, it's because of the good That you're doing yeah. Even if all a man is doing Is he's praying It's helping So look after Ramadan uh, You're not going to be able To maintain that same level Of consistency mm. because Or intensity sorry Because Ramadan is Focus one month, right? But you've got to take something. Like maybe pray in Fajr in the masjid. Okay, if you can't pray Fajr, pray Isha in the masjid. Okay, if you can't fast all the time, maybe maybe fast Monday, Thursday. If you're you talking about outside Ramadan. Outside Ramadan, right? Yeah. Just keep some type, of, yeah. some type of habit from Ramadan, which you weren't doing before. Mm. And then every Ramadan, you use it as an opportunity to just upgrade. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. upgrade. Like you get a new phone, just get a new That's it. Iman, level of Iman. That's say. literally what it is. Yeah, alhamdulillah for that, bro. And I hope people who listen to that right now actually take that on board. And hopefully. I mean, hopefully, inshallah, this probably might release in the month for Ramadan. I think it makes sense too, so I'm going to do that, inshallah. inshallah. But while they can, especially leading up to the last 10 days, 
it's the most beautiful thing. Right. What is it? Obviously, I, I've kind of know, um, but I want to make it apparent for people yeah. who don't know. What's the significance of the last ten days of Ramadan? So the last ten days has got a night called Laylatul Qadr. Yep. And what's significant about this night is that Allah said, "Khairu min al fishar." It's better than a thousand months. So a thousand months, eighty-three years. So if you if you get this one night, the reward you get is more than the reward of worshiping Allah for a thousand months. In the words of the ends, you hit a lick. You hit a lick. <laughs> and you know what's crazy? Allah didn't. It's not. It's not a thousand months. It's better than a thousand months. Yeah. How much better? Only Allah knows. Ten times better. Twenty times. Yeah, it could. It, it could be better than a million months. We don't know. We don't know. So the thing is, in the last ten nights, it's one of those nights, and the Prophet didn't tell us which one. Some people say it's the 27th, but is the, the strongest view is that we don't know which one it is. So the point is in these last 10 nights, you go hard mm-hmm. just so you can get that reward. Bro, it's funny. You go to a mosque in London, East London, on the 27th night. Obviously, no one knows when Laylatul Qadr Tukadar is. Mm. You go on the 27th night, yeah, the whole of Ramadan Durari, the mosque has started off mm. packed in the beginning, the first three days of Ramadan packed. You can't get a space for Durari, mm. yeah. Alhamdulillah, as weeks go on, I remember this happened last year because obviously I haven't been in the UK for Ramadan this year. Um, last year, first week, most slowly dies out toward mm-hmm. the end. Middle of Ramadan, half capacity. Mm. End of Ramadan, slowly picking up. 27th night, you Flood. can't get a space. You could not get a space at all. And it's so <laughs> funny because it's 27th night. You go 28th night, same thing as yeah. middle of Ramadan. Everyone thinks that it's 27th night, 27th night. Yeah. But as you just said, it's not a guarantee. Allah didn't say when it is. Yeah. The Prophet Muhammad's peace be so upon him didn't say when it is. 100. So you've got to be there all the time regardless yeah. anyway. And that should just show you well, like, the generosity of Allah. Mm. Like Allah is the just wanted to make it easy for this ummah to get as many good deeds as possible. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We're going to live for 60, 70 years. We get an opportunity every year to catch one night. But you get the reward of 80 plus years, which is longer than the average lifespan. Mm. So that Lord then his generosity shouldn't just shouldn't be repaid then with 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 ingratitude and disobedience and disrespect. Like that should make you think that's Allah. Like he really he doesn't just want me to get to gender. Like Allah wants me to get to the high part and spot mm. in gender. But Allah's the best part. Like, I've lived the life of sin and distance. But Allah is making it so easy for me to come back. Like these brothers here who've been on their deen for the last 20, 30 years, I can catch up with them and pass them if I just catch one night. But you can't treat it with the mindset of one night I'm going to go back to whatever it is that I want to do because you don't know if it's accepted. Right? Yeah. You you have more knowledge than me and I, I want to ask you this because this is what I heard about Laylatul Qadr. Yeah? The reason why Allah had made Laylatul Qadr, correct me if I go wrong here, please, um, is that in the olden days, in the old prophets' days, mm-hmm. peace be upon them, they used to live a lot longer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they obviously they had more time to do salah. Absolutely. So whenever they live for 200 years, 300 mm-hmm. years, whatever mm-hmm. the case is, obviously they have Years on us with this mm-hmm, a lot, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it came into our ummah for Laylatul Qadr mm-hmm. because obviously we have lifespans of let's just say 100 years maximum mm-hmm. uh, at that point, sometimes 70 80 years. Am I right in saying yeah, that? Yeah, or? absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. On, on you yeah. hit the nail on the head. Many of the scholars they mentioned that, mashallah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. Got, yeah. got some sort of knowledge. In. No, you're good, bro. I just need the top in as well. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Conversations like this, I know this is a podcast, but conversations like this reminds me of a conversation or something my brother said. Yeah, um, not blood brother, one of my brothers named Ty Mitchell. He said. Because uh, I remember we all filmed on a podcast at a time and off camera he was like, when you ha- when you talk about Allah, the more you talk about Islam, you can never get bored of it. You can never have enough of talking about Islam. You can never have enough of talking about Allah. Mm-hmm. And it goes to show because you can talk about stories for days. You can talk about stories from the prophets, mm-hmm. talk about hadiths, you can talk about Quran. You can, there's so much you can talk about. It's infinite amounts. And even to a point where you go on YouTube and there's so many videos you can just see, mm-hmm. always constantly learning new things, learning new things. But I want to take you back to your life now, right? Mm-hmm. So at this point now where you had this reflection point in the mirror and you realised you haven't listened to music in six months, mm. how did you see your life, your personal life, business life change from that point? Did you see it going up or was it a flat line or how did you see it? Did you see, did you see your life having more blessings and barakah in it? I, wallahi bro, I swear by Allah Azza wa Jal bro, when I look back at the 10 years or 12, 13 years since then, since that moment, my life's been filled with so much blessing. Let's, let's move away from the last 12, 13 years. Akhi Wallah, just this Ramadan. You know the Prophet Sallallahu said, Umrah to Umrah, every, Umrah to Umrah increases your risk. What do you uh, mean Umrah to Umrah? As in, if you do one Umrah, yeah. and then you go do another one, in between the two, your risk, i.e. your provision will go up. A provision is, could be wife, 
could be children, money, it could be all of that, right? It could be iman, all of that. Akhi, I can swear by Allah Azza wa Jal. Akhi, I swear by Allah. Every umrah to umrah, akhi, my bank balance goes up. Every, akhi, just like even some of the opportunity, since I just went to umrah recently, I looked at the time bef- between that, bro, like our income, like, like monthly income, like, like quadrupled. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Allah barik. And just now, since the previous Umrah, now, now I'm plan, now I'm planning to go Umrah, inshallah, at the end of this week. Inshallah, inshallah. And if Allah gives me life and I get to go, just between the previous one to now, already so much has happened. Do you know what I'm saying? But what people don't deep though, is that it won't happen overnight. That that barakah that you're looking for, it won't necessarily come overnight. Yeah, no, Sometimes overnight. Allah will test you. Yeah. Sometimes you might go eight months. Like within these 12, 13 years, I've had so much barakah, but I've had moments where I've been homeless. I've had moments where I've lost everything three times. But what you find is that Allah is testing you. And he's building your character. If you're patient for long enough throughout the process, you will find act blessings. Bro, I, I apologize for being on my phone there, but no, you're good, I, I agree exactly what you're saying and I wanted to put this in proof. Did you watch the full Andrew Tate podcast I've done? I didn't get to the end of it, no. But okay, so I'll let you just just press play on this, uh-huh, uh-huh. and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. When you talk about Umrah, uh-huh. your, your, your zik and everything, you'll see exactly why I'm showing you that video. Because at the end of it, I was like, I have to put this message in there. Okay, let me check this. Oh wow! Oh wow! I was like, yeah, cool. Oh wow, that's. That's insane. I had to uh, put that message in there because you know when, so to give people who are listening to the audio context, I, I, said, I said this in a, another podcast as well, to be fair. <laughs> Allah, um, Allah. That's actually powerful. Just, just to explain it to you boys as well, if you may not know. I actually said um, chills down my spine. Yeah. But that one was crazy. But the way that one happened, I wrote, I've done a podcast with a brother. His name is Nasir Yurimi, yeah? Yeah, Nasir, yeah. Um, and he was telling me, bro, when you go Umrah next, write a list of your du'as. Like actually, because I've done Umrah before, Alhamdulillah. Whenever I've done a du'a, or whenever you try, when you go in front of the Kaaba, they say, do du'a, my head goes blank. So this time I was like, cool, let me, let me take his advice, let me write a list. So I wrote down a list and all that sort of stuff. Could be brand deals, could be this, could be that, whatever. And I wrote this list, went to the Kaaba obviously, pulled out the list, made du'as. On that list was two things, Andrew Tate podcast, Tristan Tate podcast. They were both locked in two days after that. So what I'm just trying to show is exactly as you're saying there. Put up a screenshot of the du'as. Yeah. Yeah. And I put the message, I had to put that at the end, at the end of Andrew Chase's podcast because I was like, you can't deny the power of Allah. Literally. And I was like, I need everyone who sees that podcast, over, uh, over 1.5 million people now need to see that message. Because in a way, whether they're non-Muslim or whether they're Muslim, it's kind of, I see it as a way of da'wah. Increasing people's, you know, oh, iman and uh, and having their, their belief in Allah. Because exactly, yeah. bro, you showing that putting that they increased my iman just now. Is it? Well, like, that helped me. Hey, uh, imagine uh, that I increased the dawah man's iman. you help, man. Look, 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 what I want people to understand is this, bro. Okay, bring it back to you. I've never made a single dua in my life, and I've made some pretty audacious duas, but I've not made a single one. That hasn't been accepted. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say, what do you mean you haven't made a dua in your life? <laughs> it's for the intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but you know what? It's true, bro. Because you know, even reflecting back on the duas I made when I first started this podcast, yeah, little things like, you know, like increase me in wealth or increase me in the podcast, essentially, right? And then at the time, bear in mind, it's been three, four years since that dua. You don't remember every single dua you make. But then when these things happen, and they take place and you think to yourself, raw, I remember making that dua. I remember being in my room at night, the hajjid, making that dua. And I can safely say, I think it was Ramadan, maybe 2020 in lockdown when I made all these duas and now here we are today, alhamdulillah. So I have, the alhamdulillah, solid, solid faith in the power of Allah and, and Islam and everything like that, which is what I want everyone who listens to the podcast you, you, to have as well. You know what, what, people, what people need to deep here as well though, and this, 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 this is, this is where it gets deep. Dua means to call, right? It means what, sorry? To call. Okay, yeah. To call, to ask, right? Mm-hmm. Allah is saying, if you call me, I respond. Regardless of circumstance, I will respond. Whether you're a sinner, whether you're righteous, Allah is saying, I will respond. 
Because Allah is generous, He likes to give. So we, we want something from Allah, and we make dua sincerely, Allah gives us, as He saw, right? In your own life. But then Allah also calls us, and Allah makes a, what you would call a dua or a da'wah, a call. He makes a da'wah to us. Allah says in Surah Al-Anfal, respond to the call of the Messenger. لِمَا يُحْيِيكُمْ That which will give you life. So when we call out to Allah, and we our calling is a dua, where we're asking. Allah is not making dua to us like He needs something from us. But Allah is making a, a, a da'wah. He's making a call because He wants something from us in return now. Which is to be good, to be obedient. Why is it we don't respond? Mm. Allah responded to me. But when it was now my tr- turn to respond to Him, I didn't. And that's, just, that's, 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 that's what it just pains me. It's like, but Allah is so generous. And every time if you turned away from him, you came back, he's there. He's ready to respond. But us, we're the ones that let Allah down. To break that down further, just for my understanding mainly, in what ways would Allah be calling to us? Okay. Allah is always calls us through obedience to him. The salah, the zakat, the hajj. Also Allah is always calls us to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, to not do bid'ah, to not do innovation, to also worship Allah alone, to not worship other gods, to... Respect our parents, right? Also, there are things that Allah calls us to stay away from. For example, alcohol, drugs, free mixing, fornication, transactions which are haram, engage in riba, or gambling. We all know. We all know what Allah wants from us. Like, I don't think anyone's baffed what Allah wants from. Everyone knows what Allah yeah, wants yeah. from us. That's what Allah's calling you to. Do that. Do what Allah wants you to do. Now it's Isha time, for example. It's not, but let's say it's Isha time. Allah's, Allah's, Allah and Mishra called me now to pray Salah. Fajr time, they're calling me that. When my mom's calling me and she wants something from me, that's actually Allah and His Messenger asking something from me because they told me to be obedient to my mom and to be good to my mom. So that's what Allah is calling us to. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. Yeah. And correct me once again if I'm wrong here, this is what I've heard. Allah, the one, uh, well, in fact, you say Allah answers your du'as in three ways, right? Mm-hmm. What are those three ways? So either Allah Azza will give you what you want, or Allah Azza will replace it with something better, or Allah Azza will store it for you in the next life and give it to you in Jannah. And you know what shocks me? You know when you deep the three, the lowest of those responses is being given what I want. Mm. If Allah replaces it with something better, better than what I asked, that's a shout. Yeah. <laughs> or if Allah leaves it for me in the next life, even better. <laughs> so people think, like, do you know what I'm saying? If I get what I want, that's amazing. But that's the lower of the three. Yeah. Some people are upset. I asked for this, I didn't get it. I said, well, there's things that I was asking for 10 years ago only came true now. There's things that I was asking for for years and it came true, came true years after but in a different way. I said, Allah, Alhamdulillah, Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal never ceases to respond. Amaze us, yeah. And he, and he will, Allah will always have your back. But it's us that don't have that that, 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 that that let Allah down. When you woke up in the morning and you had health and you woke up to safety and you woke up breathing and your heart is functioning and all your organs are okay, Allah didn't let you down. When you when food was in the fridge, Allah didn't let you down. Right? When 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 you woke up, you say, Allah never lets us down, but it's we 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 let Allah as a virgin down. That's the muscular. That's like me, I've got a chip on my shoulder, I'll be honest with you. Like I, I have crazy dreams, bro. And I have crazy ambitions. Like at the beginning, I said to you, like, I'm trying to make a thousand brothers or a thousand Muslims become millionaires in the next 10 years. Akhi, record this. Keep it. Question. Ask me in 10 years. I've got a chip on my shoulder and I have certainty it's going to happen. Allah said, Udu'ullah wa antum muqinuna bil ijaba. Make dua to Allah whilst you're certain He's going to respond. I'm certain, Ak. I'm going to help 1,000 brothers become millionaires, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah. Currently, Ak, my that, where I'm, Ak, I remember I used to make this dua years ago, bro. Saying, so, Allah, I want to give that to all these influencers, these celebrities, all the movers and shakers, right? And I used to make that dua solid for like a year and a half. But dua I never, ever, I never saw it come to fruition. I actually stopped making it. Last year, Akhi, the kind of celebrities that are reaching out to me, the kind of guys that are shouting out to me, not just celebrities. Akhi, you know, people look at celebrities as these are influencers. With all due respect, the celebrities are not the influencers. The guys that are giving them the paycheck, they are the real moves and shakers. And then, man, I pull it up, yo, I can pick you up. I mean, if they don't speak like yo, I whatever, take you for lunch, speak to you here, invite you here, and they just want to know about the deen. And now uh, they're getting onto their deen. Mm. So, I had this goal and this ambition years ago, but I'm starting to see it come true now. So I, I have crazy, like, like I'm trying to build a masjid 
in the next like five, six, seven years, inshallah, inshallah. ta'ala, which is going to be a masjid that is going to be run, the way a masjid is supposed to be run. It's going to be an example for the world. And I actually made a promise and a commitment. I'm not going to take a single donation. I'm not going to take a single donation. Even people beg me and say, Imran, I beg you, please. I have, wallah, I have brothers come to me and say, please take the money. Please take the money. I say, I'm not. You know why? I'm going to do it off the own of the back of my own money that Allah has facilitated me. I don't, I'm, and I actually believe that I am going to build a business where I will have surplus income of seven mil that I'm going to be able to put into build this mystery, inshallah, and still inshallah. have enough left over. And I just, look, I've said it. People can hold me to account, inshallah ta'ala. Five, ten years from now, did it? And you're going to see it. As long as I say true to my Lord, my Lord, Lord will never let me down. And I just hope, I just, my, the thing that's happening, people just don't have the patience to wait to see their Lord's response. That's what it is. When I purchase something from Amazon, sometimes it will tell me it's coming at 9 p.m. next day. And sometimes it comes late. Sometimes it comes two weeks late. But the moment I've checked out and I've clicked buy, it's mine. It's on the way. Dua sometimes can be like that. The moment I've raised my hands and I've made that dua with sincerity, with focus, concentration, with also repentance to Allah, I, I know it's coming. But it's just when? I just, it's the delivery date. It's the delivery date. Yeah. You mentioned something there about masjids, you know, and you're going to run a masjid properly the way it should be run. Mm. Before I come to that point, because I think that's an interesting point, it has a question off the back of that. Mm. Going back to points where you said you've made the du'as years ago that you've seen come true mm. maybe last year or more recently. Mm. Can you give me a couple of examples that you may you, du'as you may have made years ago, whether it be in 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that you've seen transpire and come true to this day, like more recently? Okay. <laughs> a du'a I used to make, I used to say Allah, because I, when I started practicing, I was on my own. I didn't really have a team or nothing. I just had these ambitions. I'm going to run this project, run that project. Um, I made a dua I said Allah Give me a team That's going to be like The Muslim version Of the Avengers <laughs> I need a team I, need, I can't do this on my own When I look at the people That Allah has placed In my life right now My mind is Mind blown like I was telling you earlier Right That one of the brothers That we're connected to And hopefully we'll See how it goes But we look like We're, we're, we're trying to just Make a deal right now Inshallah ta'ala and join forces with this brother. Because this brother is a brother who's done, who's the CEO of a company where he's done digital marketing for clients like Emirates Airlines, like Address Hotel, like the Mac Properties, like Ema. So in Avengers terms, he's basically Tony Stark. He's the Iron Man. I guess. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, but, but, and we've got Captain Dawa here. Right. So I'm saying, I'm saying but I, I could have never in my life have imagined that I'm going to be able to have access to a brother like that. We, we just go for the act. Well, I sometimes, before we even started to talk about business, the things that he was giving me, the value he gave me over like one, two breakfast meals, like he was one of the things that helped us. You know how I said our money like quadrupled, like mm. at least, at least, at least doubling, if not more, just from one, two meals that we had. Then, not just that, the, the, the inner circle that I have, brother Abbas, Abu Bakr, the brothers that you see here, I, did, I could have never have imagined for guys with this type of loyalty, this type of like skill. I'll give you an example. So, you know, con you, uh, you, my name is not is not disconnected from controversy, and I've had all sorts of controversy around me, and I've been involved in a bunch of stuff. Okay, I've had people trying to attack me online. I've had situations in government level, like David Cameron, Theresa May, one time was talking about me in one of their Cobra meetings. Really? And, yeah, it was published in the newspaper. They labeled me as a non-violent extremist. One brother made a lot of wood, and we took it to court. Because they mentioned him as well And they got repealed And then they revoked it But I'm saying I've had that level Of people on me I had this time Where ISIS had an official hit on me They actually put, put Said We have an official hit on this guy mm. Right So I'm saying From all angles Akhi, I've had All sorts of Chaos And calamity Being directed my way I've had One time I got There was a madness Where there was um, A mafia from a particular country That was onto me Because one guy Got involved in business with them Was using my name So Got sticky. They honest. They 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 used to come to the masjid. I used to give da'wah, mm -hmm. looking for me, and I used to have to set up decoys. And yeah, yeah. People don't even know the half of it. It's been a madness. So what? Alhamdulillah, I have is a team of brothers that help me manage all of these catastrophes and these chaoses. Right? This brother Abbas, for example, right here. This brother studied game theory. Yeah. So you studied what, sir? Game theory. Okay. Game, now, game theory is not about games. Yeah. It's about 
understanding outcomes with a multiple people variables and factors in place and try to work out what people's decisions are going to be and what's the best move that you should make anticipating their decision. So you're the Doctor Strange. <laughs> okay. So when, it, when a madness kicks off And we have a little WhatsApp group We call it the Cobra Like yeah. you know how in, in Parliament yeah, yeah, We've got, yeah. co- we got yeah. our own Cobra I've got brothers in this group bro Like I'm saying that on their dean They've got life experience Business experience ah, the, 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 the experience in this group Is second to none So whenever a madness kicks off It's like bro When you're, when you're beefing me Bro you're not beefing me You're coming after me And there's a There's there's, there's, a team a, behind. there's a team there's a, there's a Cobra squad behind me Do you know what I'm saying yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what like, There's so many examples I can give you Alhamdulillah bro. That's one dua I made And to be in, in To be in the place That you're at Like for example You interviewed the brother Andrew Tate Look at how the world Is on to him They're trying to shut him down When you're in these positions Where you are speaking You're saying certain things That are controversial Challenge the status quo People don't like your message You need to be on guard You need to have your back covered mm-hmm. So Having access to people like that And them being my closest boys Alhamdulillah Is a blessing having access to those type of people, actually having access to scholars, actually. like I, t- I chat to scholars daily, bro. Like daily, daily, bro. Like I will, I have mashaykh, actually, when, when, most people when they go to a lesson, they go to Medina University, he's one guy in a class with like 70, 80, 30, yeah. 20, whatever kid. I do my lessons with my mashaykh one-on-one. I could have never imagined to have access to ulama, actually, that teach me one-on-one. Like when, and it's, so it's not just a lesson, but it's a, it's, my life I'm bringing to the table every day that they're just helping me direct and understand it in accordance to the Quran and Sunnah. So this is a dua I made. And Allah really made it come true. I had a, I had a dua, bro. I remember I was sitting in Pizza Hut, not eating the haram one, just vegetable pizza. <laughs> and I remember I sat with my boy, who's in the UK right now, actually currently he's in Umrah, and I said to him, bro, we're going to take this dua, uh, this da'a across the world. Actually, this is before like even YouTube was a thing. I had no social media platform or presence. I used to just go to the da'a table and talk to Christians every week. Like I said, we're going to take this da'a across the world and bro we did like I, yesterday I'm coming out of um, the masjid where Mishari was leading masjid Hind Mishari's world famous recital his place, place is packed everyone's come for him at the end like, just a flood of people that were coming up to me and I don't like that stuff like, anyone who knows me like, I don't like it if you ask me to take a picture I'll take it because I don't want to break your heart but I don't like that stuff I, I really despise it but just to see the people that were touched like Bro, when I start practicing after I watch your video, I watch your video, I start praying salah. I'm in Dubai. Same thing will happen to me now. I'll go to America, I'll go to Canada, I'll go to Kenya, I'll go to Gambia. People will tell me the same thing. So that Allah made it come true. So that is many more. There's many more. Alhamdulillah, bro. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Coming to the point which I mentioned earlier, you, mm-hmm. see, you want to make a masjid where a masjid is run properly. Mm-hmm. What is it, I'm assuming, that you feel like some of the masjids you have been to or some of the masjids around the world aren't run properly? It's the blind leading the blind. What do you mean by that? So uh, when you want to, and I'm not talking about the, the teachers in the masjid there when I say that, I'm talking about the organization and the management. This deen, so the masjid is the hub from which this deen is spread. Mm-hmm. In Medina, it was masjid in Nebui, right? That's where the Prophet ﷺ would lead the prayers, where he would teach the people. He would do judgment there. People would come to him asking for judgment, advices, the delegations, all these, you know, uh, tribe leaders would come, speak to them. It, 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 that, was, that was the place where it all kicked off, right? Yeah. So the masjid has got to be the heartbeat of the society. It's got to be the heartbeat of the community, right? That's where we educate the people. That's where we do the janazas. People, that's where we do the... Everything happens there. You get married, you call an imam. He has to perform the nikah, right? Every Friday, go Jumma khutbah this. I, I learn my deen from there. I learn Quran from there. The masjid is... stems from there. It stems from there. So, actually, the masjid is responsible for managing the people within that community. But, you know, management is a skill that we don't have. I learned this from being around these, CC, these C-suite executives. The way these guys operate, running like companies where there's 250 people underneath them. You know, one brother I know, he is a, he's part of a venture capitalist firm uh, and in their fund they've got companies that they manage over like 125, 125 million investment that they have. Their portfolio in these companies, 125, 120 million, sorry, dollars. And he's managing like 25 companies in that portfolio and the way how he's making sure everything is happening up to date with all the stakeholders, the 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 the, the board of directors, just and showing them how to improve things. How is this one man managing all of this? I call it management is management is a skill and it's a, a skill that people don't have. Like when I have a business now, I've got KPIs, I've got key performance indicators for my team, right? I've got OKRs, I've got objectives and key results. I've got ways to measure performance. I've got ways to kind of improve certain processes and systems. If I don't get the target this year, okay, let me get it next year, right? 
Why don't we apply that to, the, to, to our deen? Now, why is it that in the madrasa, we don't have a way of understanding what we call the kids? Why are they not memorizing Quran enough? Okay, the ones that are memorizing Quran, why can't we speed up the process? Okay, why is it the kids who have graduated from the madrasa memorize Quran, but they're selling drugs in the streets? What went wrong? Mm. What went wrong? Why is it the percentage of kids who graduate from the madrasa who actually are on their deen is so low? What's going on? Why is it that 90% of the community don't turn up, or 95% of the community don't turn up to Fajr Salah, but they do turn up to Jum'ah? What's going on there? How can we market to them? Like how can we how can we how can we reach out to them? Like there's so much that is at play here. There's so much like to manage the 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 the, the salah, to manage the lessons. What lessons am I teaching? I've got a guy that, that who I've brought to give the khutbah, but he's talking a different language. Okay, okay, if he talks in English, he's not able to relate to the people. Why is it this brother is talking from a background where the community can't relate to him? What he's talking doesn't actually relate to what they're speaking. I think there's so much here. Like one of, one of the brothers broke it down earlier. He was like, you know, this whole deen, bro. You can understand, like, as in, as in there's, there's there's parallels between da'wah and business. There's marketing, there's product development, there's customer relations, there's sales, right? There's 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 there's, there's, there's management. I think like that with the deen. There's a, a marketing side. Not that I'm saying market the deen in the way that you market a business, but there is. Like what is that what, if it's not calling people, making them aware of of yeah. this deen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you understand? I know exactly what you're saying. So I clock that most people, it's not even their fault. They can't run the message the way it deserves to be run. Because like, they come from a background of maybe being a shopkeeper. And I'm not trying to disrespect him. I rate that craft, but you don't deserve to run a masjid. You come from a background, maybe you're an accountant, maybe you're a doctor, you're well to do, maybe you're some you've got some experience. But I, how is it that the guy who's managing a company with 250 people underneath him, where he's got clients that are giving him 30 mil budgets. He's man. We, we've got, we understand that that level of skill is needed to run a company like that, but we don't think that a skill of that level, if not more, is needed to run a masjid, when it's more important. And that's the problem. Mm. There's many other issues as well, the knowledge, the quality of the, t- of the teachers, the imams, the quali- there's so much. Part. Would you say this is just in the UK or all over? Oh, all over. Yeah? All over, all over, one hundred percent. Okay. Yeah, the Mushkas, the Prophet Sallallahu was an elite. He was he, akhi, wallah, he had management down to a T, bro. The way the Prophet was able to manage, think about it. He's managing armies, he's managing a state, he's managing his household. He's got nine wives. He's managing the the conflicts of the people. The Prophet had management down to a T. Yeah, down to a T. Okay. Akhi, I want to come to this point in the podcast, right? Because obviously the podcast is primarily based around business. Mm. Now, no secret that you are a businessman there. Mm-hmm. So, going back to the first point, mm-hmm. almost in, in the past life when you started having this recognition and started realising what's what and what's needed in your life to, to move forward, inshallah, um, what business did you have then? Because obviously you shut down the studio. Mm. You must have still been looking for some sort of hustle, some sort of business, mm. but at the same time trying to keep it halal. Yeah. So, what did you do? <laughs> well, I, I, I teamed up with one brother who was... Uh, who was uh, who was a vet, who was a coach, a BJJ coach. Oh, what's her? Yeah, BJJ. What's that? Co- Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was very, very proficient at the craft and very into like health and fitness. So I said, okay, cool. You're good at this. So I identified the product or the service rather, but he didn't know how to sell. And, you know, marketing and getting the message out there, something that always kind of came natural to me. So we said, okay, let's set up something called Sunnah Fit. Sunnah Fit, because it's from the sunnah to be healthy, right? Mm-hmm. As in the sunnah has so many things that it teaches us in terms of food, provision, certain sports like archery, swimming, like it's all in sunnah. So I was like, okay, cool. So we're going to call it sunnah fit. And um, I teamed up with him and we put together a, a digital product. So we're going to make a diet. But the diet is going to incorporate prophetic foods. So the Prophet said, there's so many hadith on prophetic medication and food and honey and so we just did research on the scientific benefits from it, the nutritional the nutritional benefits, and we put this together. We called it the Khatam diet. Khatam means the seal. So the point was it, was, it was, it was like the seal of all diets. So we put it together, alhamdulillah, was Bola's first ever digital product. What year is this then? This is like... Digital product, it must have been fairly recent to some extent, no? Like this is like 2011. Yeah, 2011. Yeah, yeah, so... So... Um, so uh, I remember, bro, we were selling it for like twenty pound. I made a rack, thousand pound off that. Is it, mashallah? Yeah, I thought, whoa, okay, this is in the space of how long? 
maybe maybe like a couple of weeks, but that was my first ever like first ever take on it, yeah. First ever halal business venture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how did that make you feel in comparison to? I'm sure the studio would have made more money than the thousand pounds, right? Yeah, at the time, oh yeah, studio was making halal more, versus yeah. haram. How did that make you feel? I made me feel exuberant because I remember I used to think I don't know how to make money unless it's haram or illegal, and then. Eliza just, you know, he, got, he opened up so many doors for me. I started getting mentors. I, st- I remember me, I, I saw one advert of a guy who was a practicing brother who was on his dean, who was a student of knowledge, graduated from Medina University, but he was also a businessman. So he was doing a course, a five-day course, mentorship course on business leadership and whatnot. It was like £2,000. I was like, bro, I ain't got, now I'm broke. I've got nothing. So I managed to scrape the money, went to that course, blew my mind. Okay, cool. So he told us, you could do things online, Facebook, Facebook marketing, this is what you do. Not even ads, all organic. Mm-hmm. I just started learning, educating. And I honestly, and, and, and that's the thing, like, well, like anyone who educates themselves will has whoever has the mindset of let me learn, okay, you're not you're gonna be un, un, un uh, unmatchable. I finish a book every three days. Really? I finish a book every three days. And by the way, I read every day in Arabic, religious books, and I also read English books in terms of business, personal development. As for the English books, I finish one every three days. Favorite book? In what in what topic, like in in in, in personal development, I would say "Awaken the Giant Within" by Tony Robbins. Mm-hmm. That book was hugely beneficial in terms of marketing. Traction, that book blew my mind, blew my mind. Okay, like mostly everyone when it comes to marketing, just think about Instagram, put up a post, Facebook ad. Okay, that book will show you know nothing about marketing. Blew my mind. What book would you say? Just one book mm-hmm. has changed your life in. All aspects for the better, aside from the Quran. In terms of a religious book, I would say Adawa Dawa by Ibn Qayyim. So it, called, it is a religious book, yeah, but it changed everything, yeah? But that blew my mind. It's called The Sickness and the Cure. And that whole book is but that book is that book is deep. <laughs> it's, it's it's about how to it shows you how to get rid of sins and come back to Allah, but it shows you how that's gonna benefit you in your money, how it's gonna benefit you in your health. How's going to benefit you in your strength? How's going to benefit you in your household? It shows you how the sins that you're doing is the reason why your wife don't listen to you. It shows you how the reason sins you're doing is why you might have big biceps because you go to the gym, but you don't have no self-restraint. You can't even pull, pull, lift the blanket off yourself just to wake up and pray fajr. It shows you why you have no self-control. That book blew my mind. It shows you why you're obsessed over money. It shows you why you can't... Ah, that book goes in. It goes in. The book is, is in diff- English. I think I heard it's a translation, but it don't do it justice, bro. Yeah, you got to read it. Do, but, but it must still benefit. But in terms of um, that's after the Quran, right? And the Sunnah of the Prophet. There's also another book called Kitab al Tawheed, which is a book which is just about Allah. In terms of the English books, the first book, and it was probably because it set me off in the right direction, was Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. I look at all these, I, it's funny, I read so. I, I, Alhamdulillah, I read these books. I look at them on my bookshelf regularly. Which one did I benefit from? I asked myself that the most. Like, which one really like was like the book? Yeah, Awaken the Giant Within. That book blew my mind. I'm have to give that a read. Yeah, but that that book will show you. And even think there's there's things in all all of these books by these by the non-Muslims that are like they have un-Islamic elements and whatnot. It's always going to be there. You just got to make sure you filter all that stuff Feel out. Free. But that book, Awaken, Awaken the Giant Within, there's a reason like, why I have. Like, mindset is very important. You've got to, you've got to go out there and dream big, bro. That book will show you like I how to dream. think. Yeah, you know one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why I wanted to get you on, right, is because I feel like, I think this may be in only in the UK or Western states, but there's definitely that misconception that if you're a religious man, you come across pious. You're on your deen, spreading the message of Islam, dawah, all of it, that you can't be a businessman at the same time and that you can't be making money at the same time. And when people put hand in hand that, okay, this man's high up in terms of deen, but he's also high up in terms of making money, sometimes they slate a man because they're like, how can you be doing both? It don't align. So tell me your version of that. Yeah, because it's jarring because the Prophet was rich. Mm. Allah said in the Quran, وَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى Muhammad, we found you poor, we made you rich. It's in the Quran. It's there. And that's one of the small surahs that little kids memorize. Allah said, we found you poor, we made you rich, Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, 
what people would then throw back at you is, but didn't the Prophet have moments of difficulty and poverty? And I don't like to use the word poverty because poverty means you're in need. And the Prophet was never in need of anyone except Allah. So I don't want to say poverty, but the Prophet ﷺ had times of difficulty, no doubt. But that wasn't always the case. And not only that, when the Prophet ﷺ did have money, he would give it away. He was extremely generous. Generous. Ibn Abbas said there was no one more generous than the Prophet. ﷺ. So to give you an example, one time the Prophet ﷺ had a bunch of sheep. There was a valley between two mountains, and the sheep covered it, covered the valley. I, back in those days, that's money. Bro. Well, they're all his sheep. All his. Yeah. And you know what's proof they're all his? Because he gave it away to someone. Mm. Can a man give away something that doesn't belong to him? Mm. No. How can I give away another man's property? Well, no, you can't, can't. You can't, right? Yeah. And the Prophet was not allowed to receive charity. He was not, never a charity case. So where did the Prophet The Prophet had nine wives. How is he maintaining them? Furthermore, are you even allowed to get married to, to, to multiple wives if you can't take care of them financially? So how are you telling me the Prophet was broke? The Prophet was extremely generous. Like one time when the Prophet was sick, and he was going in and out of consciousness, he had six gold coins. He told his wife, Aisha, get rid of them. I don't want to die and go to Allah and I have this with me. The Prophet was extremely generous. He had moments of difficulty, but he was never poor. And yes, people will say that that ayah in the Quran where Allah said, we, we made you rich, uh, that's uh, talking about contentment, richness of the heart. And it's true, it is. But then also some of the scholars mentioned that it's talking about the Prophet's wife Khadija. He made him rich, i.e. he made him feel rich because of this wife that he had. But let's not forget, richness is also in terms of money. And the Prophet had it. That is, the, the Prophet had it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not just that. Okay, if you, if you, if you, if you want to be from the Prophet, <laughs> even though the Prophet used to make dua, saying, Allah, I seek refuge with you from poverty. The Prophet saying, Allah, don't make me poor. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? But then let's look at Abu Bakr, who was the best man after the Prophet from this ummah. The best man. Okay, one time he gave charity. What he gave was 40,000 silver coins. That is, that is the equivalent of about, about 6 mil today in purchasing power. If you do the maths. It's the equivalent of about 6 mil. He gave it away for the Prophet's migration. Now, some of the scholars mentioned, are you allowed to give away all your wealth? Because Abu Bakr gave away all his wealth. Because another companion wanted to give all his wealth and the Prophet said, no, don't. Leave some behind for your family. Because it, if you've given all your, of, all, all your wealth away, what happens now? You can't support your own family. And now you're poor. Yeah. Now you're begging. Mm. Or you're going to do haram to get that money, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Abu Bakr gave away all his wealth. So are you allowed to? And so the scholars mentioned that it depends on you. If you're a person who's going to be able to manage the difficulty and the consequences and the hardship that comes with now leaving, losing all your wealth, then perhaps. But there's also one other element. Abu Bakr was a businessman. He knew how to get that money back. You know why? What's proof of that? Because when he went to Medina, he did the same thing again. He gave away all his wealth a second time. Built it again, gave it away again. And not just that, he survived after that. Which means he got the money back. Mm. So uh, these, the, 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 the Sahaba had money, bro. Uh, they had money. You know, they had moments of poverty, but they lost everything and they left it behind for Allah's sake. Trusted in him and went back and built it again. So to me, I, like, I, bro, no, 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 I'm not trying to put anyone down who might be struggling financially. Because I know where I've come from. And nothing is from me. It's all from Allah's mercy and His favor. But let's call a spade a spade. Will people respect a poor man the way they respect a rich man? When the rich man says to you, all of this from Allah. So forget this, go pray. Or when a poor man says to you, pray. You're thinking, ah, you don't have anything to distract you in the first place. Mm. You're praying, one might say, even though I'm not saying it's correct to say, but one might say, Ak, You're praying because you've got nothing else to do. You've got nothing else to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a brother, I know, the one that I told you is a venture capitalist. He's got this, he's, he's, he's part of this investment firm, right? Acquisition firm where they got the $120 million um, uh, dollars worth of companies in his portfolio. I sat him down one day. I said, but why do you keep doing what you're doing? I don't even get it. What's the, from, what's the motivation now? How, <laughs> how much bread you want to make? Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Now, what's your motivation? He said to you, you know what I'm doing? What I'm doing, bro. He said, I sit with CEOs of startups that are going to be the next big thing. These guys are going to grow up to be very powerful now. I'm trying to make sure they're patterned. Because I'm trying to influence them. Because when, you know when you go, go to a CEO of a company 
uh, not just a CEO, because the CEO is an employee, but imagine you're a founder CEO and you've now got a company that's IPO'd now. Mm-hmm. It's gone public. Right? Mm-hmm. You got a chip on your shoulder. Yeah. You're a big man. People can't tell you nothing. You're in like top 0.5%. Zero, zero yeah, you're up there now. Right? You're up there. But these guys were putting down 20 mil in your company. There's a very there's a very small bracket of people that you will still look up to and think, yes, sir. All right? When you're in that situation, there's a very small bracket of people you're going to look up and think, let me be on my best behavior today. That I, I need to impress him. He's in that position. Mm. He's like, you know when you've done pre, when, when, when you got your first stage, second stage, third stage, fund, bro, we are messing with people. We're, we're putting 10, 20 mil into his business to help it go to the next stage. Yeah. He's listening to me, bro. He's here to listen to me. So you say, when I go to the, to, 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 to the quarterly meetings and they told me, okay, the money's up, this happened, that's happened. After I'm done with all that, ask them a question. How's your E-man? And they're baffed. I said, yeah, bro, we got all of that done out of the way. Let's get down to the source, bro. How's your E-man? It's okay. Okay, how can we improve it? We talked about how to bring this up and bring that metric up. Let's bring your E-man up. He said, bro, I tell them pray and they start praying. Because sometimes I don't even give them a hadith. I'm not even, he said, well, no, I'm not saying anything emotional. Sometimes people might be listening to this conversation and think, oh, there were some parts that were inspirational, some parts that were emotional, some parts that touched me. He said, act monotonously. I told them, pray. Five times a day. He says, because of my seat, it's where it's coming from. Because this, guys, don't stop drinking alcohol. It's because of the status. Because of the status, right? He said, sometimes we're making a decision, so we're, 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 we're talking about, should we, Go into this market, that market. Should we should we approach the strategy in this way? Okay, cool. We're taught to make istikhara, right? Seek counsel from Allah. Yeah. He said, once I'm done with all that, okay, go. Cool. Let's pray istikhara. What? He said, yeah. We shouldn't we ask the Lord now, the King of Kings? Mm-hmm. Let's go ask him. Mm-hmm. So, bro, very few people can be in that situation. Like I said to you at the beginning, now Alhamdulillah, because people look when they look at me, they think, oh, he's not just a hermit. He's not a guy who's just in West London who's just. Screaming every Friday, even though I, I used to scream on the mic. But it's not, he's not just that guy. Like, the guy understands the world. He understands the depth of business dynamics. He understands the depth of marital relationships. He understands the depth of social economic circumstances. And he's still on his dean. And he's showing people how to be on his dean. Yeah, let me listen to him. So that's why people want to sit down and, oh, Allah, I want this from Allah. When I'm saying all this, I swear about Allah, I'm not trying to pump myself or bring myself up. I could be gone tomorrow. What is this from Allah? But now these brothers are saying, oh, chat to me. So now, I'm to, well, there's one brother, he pulled up on me. Uh, actually, I went to him because I need some help, some advice. Why he even gave me time of day, I don't know. But I found out later, he wanted some Islamic advice from me. So this brother, he charges his clients twenty to $50,000 a week. For? For uh, company strategy. Okay, yeah. And his clients... Uh, he's got governments NH- clients, obviously, NHS yeah. was his clients one yeah. client once upon a time like, he's up there alright so at the end of the, at the end of the comment like, bro he gave me so much time I know this guy's a big man right so he helped us put our company structure together and stuff that's basic but mm-hmm. I, I come from the ends bro yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah, these yeah. things yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not second age to us right so I felt shy so I was like bro like can you Give me an invoice. I'm actually happy he didn't give me an invoice from when, when he told me <laughs> oh, just 20, 50,000 a week I'm actually happy he didn't but I said, you know, let me do it outside. He said, no, to be honest, he goes, you could do something better. He said, I want to act. How can I get barak in my business? I'm trying to make money. What can you tell me from a dean perspective that's going to help me be able to increase my money? I said, yo, bro, I got the source for you, bro. Look at this. Allah Azza wa Jal told you in the Quran, if you seek forgiveness from him, Allah will give you wealth. So every day just be seeking forgiveness. People think seeking forgiveness is only for sins. No, sometimes you don't even realize you're sinning. Mm. Just keep saying, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Say it regularly and mean it. And actually try to stop. The Prophet would do it a hundred times a day. Allah said, وَيُمْدِدُكُمْ بِأَمْوَالِ مَبَنِينَ Allah will give you children and He will give you wealth. And I told him a couple other things. He's like, okay. So why would he even come to me? Because he understood, okay, this is not like a normal tip like this is a guy who's in business himself he's got some type of background some type of relatability so for me Akhi, like when you tell me to like be broke these are the people that you can't reach out to and why I want to reach out to people like that is because from the top they can actually make 
decisions and influence that's going to filter down in their on companies. A deeper impact. Right. Mm. And not just that, when you want to raise money in, on the last 10 nights, it's man like him that you want. Mm. Do you understand? <laughs> it's man like him that you want. So why are you putting him down? You're saying, oh, don't run after money. Don't. And no one's running after money. What we want deep is that, well, I'm actually running after the akhirah. It's just that well, Allah, the way, the pro- Allah is blessing you with wealth. No, the, the Prophet said it. If you wake up in the morning and your focus every morning is the next life, mm-hmm. Allah will drag the dunya to you. So you don't need to chase the dunya. Well, well, dunya will come to you. I'm just having fun. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just doing me. Like every day I wake up, I go pay Fajr in the masjid. I sit there, I wait for the sunrise. I go have breakfast in this little Pakistani spot. I have my little dal channa, bro. My little halwa, bro. My little desi omelette and parata. Then I get to work. Then I have my drush with my mashayikh for two hours every day. Get back to work. Then spend time with family. And the rest is just Allah. Allah is what he's doing. He's just, he's just making it happen for me. I'm just having fun. I'm just, it's just, I just love the deen. So everything I do, like I told you, I have a marriage app, right? Rabbi Abbas is, 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 is my business partner in that. He built the product, Allah Barak, he's CEO as well of the company, Allah Barak, Sunnah Match. Many people must have heard of it. Why we came up with that idea? Because I grew up seeing how hard it was to fee- for, for people to find a wife in a way that's halal without... Still is. Still is, right? But And without doing it in a haram way. So cool, let's make an app. Okay, but there's other apps out there, but they don't attract the practicing audience. So my concern is just the deen. So naturally when I get into business I'm trying to find solutions to people's deen based problems mm. and the rest is history do you get me so I'm j- I'm doing business but because I love the deen I'm just trying to solve religious problems yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the consequence of that is that like, it's just growing do you know what I'm saying so so I feel like people for people to have this mindset of be broke like poverty is piety like some people it's good. Allah, Allah knows that they they shouldn't make money if they got money it'll become a fitna for them but that's not everyone and if you know that you shouldn't run after money because it can be dangerous for you, okay, don't look down on the brothers that are. But then the brothers that are, also we need to remind them, focus on the akhirah, bro. Focus Because you're going into that grave and that money's not going into that grave with you. Mm. So what are you using that money for? Right? Don't, don't, don't be that person who Allah said on the day of judgment, on the day when we bring hellfire to them. And he sees the hellfire for what is, he says, Ya laytani qaddamtu li hayati. He says, Destruction to me If only I Invested something in my life Life In that moment he realised My past life is not my life This is my life mm. I should have invested for this life Because this, this is the life yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was just chasing the dunya Do you know what I'm saying? It's sad now because Don't you think that we see a lot of people now You know Just constantly chasing dunya And not worrying about Or thinking about anything else Not thinking about the Akira Just thinking about Dunya, dunya, dunya. How can I make as much money as possible? How can I live the best lifestyle? How can I get this girl? How can I do this? How can I do that? Constantly thinking that. Though there are some people obviously who still have Islam beside them and making sure that they're praying and all that alongside of it. But then you also have people who are just full dunya and that's it. No other concerns. Allah said, you know, there's an ayah the Imam recited in the Salah the other day. Allah said, Al-Malu wal Banun, Zinatul Hayat Dunya. Children and money, wealth. It's from the beautification of this life. Well, baqiyatu salihatu. But the dhikr you do at the end of the salah, you know, at the end of the salah, you say, Subhanallah, 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 Alhamdulillah, 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 Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar, Allah. The dhikr after the salah is called baqiyatu salihat. Allah said, it's better and greater to Allah. You're, thinking, you're running after the cars, the clothes, the women, the kids. But Allah is saying, that dhikr you do, after the salah to say Allahu Akbar is better than all of that if only you knew and for people who don't know how to do dhikr how many times is it for each thing you say 33, 33 and the last one 34, 34. so subhanallah 33 alhamdulillah 33. Akhi, you know what's mad there's a hadith the Prophet said whoever says subhanallah 10 alhamdulillah 10 Allahu Akbar 10 times just 10 the other one is 33, 10 times, we'll go to Jannah. Yeah, inshallah, inshallah. The people, the Sahabi asked the Prophet, the Prophet So why, uh, why is it so few do it? 
Do you know when I realised, or I, to be fair, I always knew that dhikr is very, very important, yeah? And then I, uh, I saw a video one time on YouTube, and it was saying in the times of the Dajjal, the when, you know, he's going to come starvation, and it's going to be mm. tempting for, it's going to be tempting for you to go to him because he's going to provide the food and all that sort of stuff. The thing that's going to fill you up in them times is your dhikr that you do now. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's crazy. Isn't, isn't that not, even, even there's a hadith, uh, and I, uh, I, I believe the hadith you're referring to is, when Ya'juj and Ma'juj they come Yes yeah. And Isa alayhi will take everyone to the mountain and There'll be no food for no one I f- Sorry I think yeah. it was Ya'juj and Ma'juj yeah. And, yeah. and just, just by doing tasbih mm. You're going to be full So I, the, the point is that is you got to have your eye on the prize bro And and this this stuff will not fill you up Like people are chasing the women and the glitz and the glamours Because that's what's in front of them And that's what they see You know I, I came across this study About habituation you know, you're more likely to believe something if it's repeated twice. You're, you're 50% more likely to believe something if it's repeated twice. Even if it's false. Mm-hmm. Just deep that for a second. Yeah. This is false. But I'm 50% more likely to believe it just because it got repeated. What if it's repeated again and again and again and again and again and, again and then it showed to me and it's mentioned in the podcast and then not only that, the algorithm understood me so it's putting those videos in front of me. It's mm-hmm. putting those ads in front of me, right? Mm-hmm. Of course I'm going to believe it So For so many of us We've become habituated To the dunya We see the dunya And we're told This is what you need to do This is what you need to do Get the girl Get the money This is where it's at This is what success is This is what success looks like So that's why people Became distracted From the reality Coming off Away from business Ever so slightly I want to get your opinion On this right mm. It's been something That I've seen on social media Recently A few videos I watched last night On it as exactly as well The fact that Leading up to the end of the times, the Dajjal, the, the signs of the arrival is that there are going to be cows, red, clou- red cows that are going to be slaughtered, right? And I saw like Ali Dao and stuff post a video recently as well where it's like they've now found these red cows. Mm-hmm. So what's your whole take on that? So I'm not familiar with that hadith to be honest. Um, that doesn't mean that it's, that, that mm-hmm. just because I don't know it's false. There's many hadith I have, may not have come across. But the concept of the signs of the day, just bro, that's it. That's been in our face for a minute, bro. Mm. That's left, right, center. Like, there's a hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that a person would leave his house and be notified of what happened in his home or with his family through his thigh. Through his thigh? That, it's that specific? Hadith mentions on his thigh, bro. That's crazy Because where do we put our phones Where do you put your phones bro That is mad And it's had this Been there Since the time of Prophet Sallam mm. <laughs> It's not We've got manuscripts Where you can find Dating back This hadith It's not like we made this up Like a couple yeah, of years yeah. ago Like the Prophet Sallam Told us That um, You have women They've never been seen before They'll be dressed But they're naked okay, That's a description That You'd think how oh, does it even make sense? Dress but naked. That doesn't even make sense. Yeah, bro. What? Thinking of one on the top of my head right now. We're in Dubai, obviously. Mm. The sheikhs will compete for the tallest buildings. Right. You know, something simple it, You know what's so interesting? Is that, they, alhamdulillah, the Burj Khalifa was made here. And then in Jeddah, they, yeah, want, they, 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 they want to do the tallest tower as well. The there. tallest tower, right? Yeah. That kind of slowed down. But already, alhamdulillah, the next These tallest tower. Creek tower. Right? It's being built here. So, um, uh, there's so many, bro. There's, there's so many hadith. Akhwalai, the Prophet said the time killing will start, where and it becomes so rampant, the person will kill, and the one being killed will not know why he was killed, and the one who killed will not know why he killed him. Akhwalai, I sat in front of a brother. I sat in front of a brother. One of the brothers I was giving da'wah to stabbed someone, bro, and I looked him in the eyes, bro. I said, why did you do it? The guy shanked someone, bro. Why did you do it? Wallahi, he looked at me and said. That's insane. How's a man telling you I pulled out a knife and I pushed it into someone, bro? And I don't and, know I, why. I can't tell you why. Yeah. See, the stuff like that is crazy. Yeah. Bro. So we've um Allah said in the Quran, innahum yarawnahu ba'ida wa narahu qariba. Allah said, they think the day is far. We say it's close. Allah, the one who placed the day, akhi, is telling you the day is close, akhi. very close, very close, akhi. Does it does it scare you in any way? It has to. It has to. The, the day of judgment, Akhi, Allah, the names Allah gives it, Tamatul Kubra. The great 
calamity, the great calamity, yomun asir, the difficult day, the difficult day, Akhi. very scary, bro. Very scary. Uh, obviously, I know it's gonna be scary. That was a pretty much of a dumb question, but what I'm trying to say is, a man in your position, practicing doing as much as you can for Iman. Obviously, what we do in this life, in that sense, we're trying to prepare ourselves for the Akira, right? And this being part of that, knowing that the, the day of judgment is going to come, is some sort of, does it give you some sort of, what, what you do now and the way you practice, does it give you some sort of mental preparation to know that this is going to come, but inshallah, by Allah's will, I will survive it in a way and I'll be all right, if you know what I mean. Does that make sense? I see your point. So, Because what I'm trying to say is mm-hmm. someone who's not practicing right now, mm-hmm. It could be very, very, very scary for them because I'm thinking, you know, when this day comes, I'm finished. I'm not even going to see Garfield written on the digital forehead. Do you know what I mean? But someone in your position where you're a lot more practicing can can see it as like, yes, it's scary, but inshallah, we got this. So you always, uh, we need a balance of hope and fear. We need a balance of hope and, and fear. So when Allah is already describes the people who made it to Jannah, Allah paints this picture for you of a discussion that takes place in paradise. And this discussion is taking place between people who have made it to Jannah. And the question they're asking is, how did you get here? Like Allah actually gives us the path mm. of how to get there. Now, and the answer that they give to each other, they say, when we were with our families, we were in a state of fear. We were scared. Mm. So, and it's not just we were scared. We were with our families were scared. You know what that's deep? Because like, your family is the time where you feel the most relaxed. Your family when you're with your wife, bro. When you're with your, with your wife, bro, that's, that's really, you're not really, like what you're thinking of, they just get a crack and put something nice on his go to, you know what I'm saying? That's not the time people are oh, scared. But people who made it to Jannah, they were always, always thinking of Allah. Not just that, Allah is always talks in Surah Al-Mu'minun about the people who come, their hearts are shaking out of fear. And the Prophet said, these are the people who fasted and they prayed Salah. They're righteous people, but they're scared. In Surah Al-Insan, Allah said, the people, they give food and they feed the poor, right? And they say, we're only feeding you for Allah's sake. We don't want any reward from you, nor do we want any thanks. Why are we doing this then? We are scared. We're scared from our Lord a day that's going to come, that's going to turn the faces. So the point is that the righteous people are scared. And they have to be scared. I told you the Prophet ﷺ was scared that he was going to die with six gold coins with him. Allah told you on the day of judgment, Kullu ummatin jathia, Every nation will fall on their knees. Mm. From them the prophets are going to fall on their knees. When the prophets see the, the sirat that's over hell, the bridge between where they are and, and, and we'll take it to Jannah underneath his hell, they're going to say, Allah ma sallim sallim, Allah ma sallim sallim. Oh Allah, safety, safety. Oh Allah, safety, safety. It's a day of fear. So, the reason I'm saying this is because Allah is merciful. Allah is forgiving. Allah can forgive all sins. But I feel in this day and age, we need fear more than... Like, I feel like we've got too much hope. Like, when you speak to a guy who's doing the most sin, what will he tell you? Like, Allah is forgiving. Mm. Yeah, Allah is forgives. For people who try. For people who, As in, let's just say you're struggling with a sin. You wake up, you repent. But you fall into the sin again. You wake up, you repent. You fall back into Constantly the sin. Constantly rep- repenting. Say that again, sir? Constantly repenting. Yeah. And what does repentance mean? You're sincere. You're genuine. You mm. actually regret it. You want to stop. You're trying. You make a decision to stop. Yeah, but it's just a bad habit. But you fall into it at night. Akhi, for you, there's hope. But the guy was like, bro, I'm go- he's, gonna, he's, do- he's doing the sin. There's no there's regret. There's no guilt. There's no guilt. That. Yeah, that's when you've lost your iman. Allah's forgiven. I wouldn't say necessarily you lost your iman because, it, but I'll say your iman is weak, most mm. doubt. 
you could lose it, but you could still be Muslim, but weak. Yeah. I'm saying for you, bro, you're banking on Allah's mercy, but Allah's telling you the righteous people are scared. So you got there's a guy who's like, I I've done the most sins. I'm destined to help. I'm gonna sit and tell him, bro. Allah forgives all sins. Like, actually, I'll show you how deep it is. Fahisha. Fahisha is a word used to describe a filthy sin. And it's three sins Allah describes with the word Fahisha in the Quran. One is zina, a man sleeping with another woman. Mm -hmm. It could be adultery or fornication. Another time Allah uses it to describe the people of Lut. So it's homosexuality, sodomy, right? A man with another man. Is it the time of Prophet Lut, is that where Angel Jibreel literally lifted, lifted him up. the whole thing? Yeah. yeah, demolished him. And demolished him. Yeah. But Allah refers to the sin that they did as fahisha. Yeah. Allah is saying this, fahisha means filthy. But this word was only used to describe three sins in the Quran. Number one, zina, specifically. Mm -hmm. Number two, sodomy. And number three, incest. Allah referred to a man sleeping with his father's wife mm -hmm. as fahisha. His stepmom. Yeah, 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 yeah. As fahisha. Right? And then Allah talks about you can't sleep, you can't marry your mom, you can't marry your sister's incest, right? So is Fahisha something nasty? Yeah. Nasty, bro. Nasty. A man sleeping with his stepmom. Nasty, bro. Right? But then when Allah talks about the people who go to Jannah, <laughs> this is what baths me. Allah said, Allah said, rush to Jannah. It's it, it, and then he described Jannah. Allah said, للمتقين, We've prepared it for the pious ones. Then Allah describes who the pious ones are. And this was going to blow your mind. So, who are the pious ones that Jannah is for? The ones who've done fahisha. The ones who've done fahisha. But repented. But then they repented. I've got a spot on there. Mashallah. Allah. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you back to a point where you said earlier when you said even the prophets, when they're walking across the bridge, they're going to be asking for. For they're going to be scared, right? Mm. But it reminds me of the hadith I heard that I heard, sorry, where even the angels are going to be scared when because this brings me to a hadith I heard where the angel Jibreel was with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam one night, and um, there was a man that approached, um, and angel Jibreel at this point is scared, and uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him, "Why are you scared? Like who's this man?" And angel Jibreel said. That's Israfil. Mm. He's only he only comes down when trumpets blown um. or, or when the world's coming to an mm -hmm, end. Mm -hmm. So for an angel, the highest of angels to be shook, mm -hmm. that made me deep. This is serious level. I'll give you another example. Right I'll give you another example. Of that same angel. So you don't show it to Miriam when he comes to Miriam mm. in the form of a man. Yeah. Because he's gonna give her the glad tidings of a, of a, of, a, of Your angel of, yeah, yeah yeah he's gonna give her the glad tidings of a son which is gonna be Isa Jesus right yeah. yeah. And for, for any, uh, just we want to make this clear as well, for any non-Muslims watching, Christians, Gabriel is yeah, uh, Gabriel, who you're Gabriel, yeah, Angel Gabriel, to, right? Yeah. So when he comes to Mary, right, to give the glad tidings of Jesus, yep. which we do not believe is God or Son of God, he's the Son of Mary, yep. he's a prophet. But when he did this year, Mary was a righteous, pious woman and she never used to come in front of men. So a man's pulled up on her. Mm. She just sees a man. Yeah. So Allah says, what she says to him is, I seek refuge in Allah I seek refuge sorry with Allah from you may Allah protect me from you in mm. kunta I she goes I, if you fear Allah Jibreel was sent by Allah the tafsir the explanation of the ayah it mentioned some of the tafsir mentioned Jibreel when he heard fear Allah he became so scared he lost his human form and really? he fell into his angelic form Lost control. The hadith mentions uh, about the angels. He, wait, he fell into what form, sorry? His, his angelic form. Okay. His yeah, yeah, original yeah, form. Yeah. Allah mentions. Must have been a big angel in front of her then. <laughs> in the Quran, Allah says, Allah talks about the hearts of the angels get into fear. When the Prophet explained, when Allah talks, when Allah talks, the angels become scared. They fall into sujood, they fall into prostration, they, 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 they fall down. Mm. And the first one that lifts his head up is Jibreel. And then all the angels ask him, what did Allah say? What did Allah say? And then he tells him this is what Allah said. So the angels are like, yeah, you're right, bro. The angels are scared, bro. That's what I'm saying. The and just to think of it like that, I was like, yeah, this is this is crazy, this yeah. is crazy. The, one of our final points I want to come to as we round up this podcast, right? 
right now you have a a business where you help brothers set up Umrah businesses, correct? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was, I was going I was going through your comments before we started this podcast, before we uh, met up and everything. Mm-hmm. When you get some comments and you get some stick for it because people are saying, and to be fair, I don't have to describe it in the right way, mm-hmm. but people will give you stick for it because it's like how are you making money from an Umrah business or how are you making money from charging people Umrah and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So explain what this business is and let's talk about mm-hmm. that whole uh, controversy people yeah. say about it. So like, well, like, it's very simple. I don't, I, I don't charge for your deen. That when it comes to da'wah, I don't charge. Allah said, the Prophet said, they said قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجَرًا We don't ask you for any reward. When I give a lecture or khutbah, there's no payment. There's no transaction. There's not... Some might ask, right? Because maybe that's... They don't... They've taken... If, if a sheikh's taken time out from work mm-hmm. to give you a lecture, then you can give him... You can compensate him for that time, right? Yeah, yeah. But alhamdulillah, Allah put me in a position where I don't need to do that. Now, if I come to give a lecture... I don't even I, I don't even allow them to pay for my travel expenses. Like if I'm coming to give da'wah, it's, it's, um, money doesn't get into it, mm-hmm. right? So I don't charge for the deen. But now when I'm giving you a service, I have the right to charge for that. Like some people ask me, bro, make sunnah match the app for free. I say, what is a service, bro? Yeah, I'm trying to solve a Muslim problem. But bro. Still comes with a cost. It's a business. Yeah. I'm giving you a service. I'm trying to help you find the woman of your dreams, mm. right? Or, or the, you're, you're trying to find the woman of your dreams or the woman you're going to marry. So likewise, Umrah, bro, like I'm not charging you to do tawaf on the Kaaba. Bro, I'm charging you for the service of putting together this whole experience for managing all the logistics to like put together this package for you. That's what I'm charging for. And now I don't even do Umrah companies, but I train brothers how to do Umrah companies. That's one of the things that we do. And, um, and there's an ayah in the Quran where Allah actually mentioned, "Laysa alaykum junahun an tabatahu fadla min rabbikum." Allah said, that "When you go to Hajj, there's no harm upon you if at the same time you try to seek profit, because Hajj is an opportunity. Especially back in the days, imagine people are coming from all over the world. That's a time for trade. Yeah. So you're going there to worship Allah, but you might also have an opportunity, a once in a lifetime opportunity, to do some trade, mm-hmm. right? So Allah said, "There's nothing wrong as long as." It doesn't mess with your original intention. And they've had So I asked some scholars and they said it applies to Umrah as well. So now I'm going to Umrah. My intention is to go to Umrah. And I'm not charging them for the Umrah. But I, there's flights involved. There's hotel packages involved. There's management involved. I've got to do all these logistics and so much. And I'm creating this great experience. That's life changing for you. I'm taking time out to come, to fly you and do all this and so on and so forth. And our Umrah trips were the best. There's a reason why people kept coming with us because we provided the best experience or one of the best experiences, right? So that's, that's a service, bro. And now I'm training other brothers to do that because so, so they can eat as well. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, so, so they don't have to go back and answer to Bob every day. Yeah. And Bob's saying, bro, you can't pray Salah. Sorry, yeah. what do you mean I can't pray Salah? I'm praying Salah. Allah wants me to pray. I'm going to pray. I don't care what you're saying. But he said, okay, you're going to lose your job then. So I'm giving them opportunities now. Do you but see, so to me, it doesn't even make sense. I don't, I don't even look at that that the, the that type of negative feedback. It's so, so a genuine question, yeah, because I see you you say this in in, the, in your Instagram reels and stuff. Generally, can you make six six figures from it? Yeah, our last our last the last year when I was doing my Umrah trip, when I was doing my Umrah trips, we only did three trips in that year. We made over half a mil in revenue, so it wasn't all profit; it was revenue. Um, and that's from three Umrah trips. Just from three Umrah trips, Mashallah. over half a mil. Alhamdulillah, we've already got. There's at least three companies that we've, at least two companies that we've trained so far that have already passed six figures in revenue. And we were, we didn't reach six figures until like our third, fourth year. They did it in their second year. Yeah, but it's obviously with the knowledge and experience that you right? have. Alhamdulillah. As you were speaking so about earlier. The company industry is a $150 billion industry. Mm-hmm. There's a, you went there, right? You see the extension, the expansion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. of the demand. Why yeah. are they expanding the masjid? Because mm. there's so much people coming. Demand. Yeah. Why are they building more hotels? Cause of the demand So um, we, we do that Alhamdulillah And, and uh, the Umrah stuff That's still running But now I'm on to another thing Which is reason, The reason we, we, we started training people How to come up with Umrah companies Because people need an idea A business idea Like I, I, I don't know what to do Yeah Okay cool we did this Let me show you um, In a world where It's full of It's way easier to make haram money Than yeah. it is to make halal money So in a world where It's full of opportunities For haram money mm-hmm. How can we then provide opportunities to make right. money? And people, but but, but now off. we wanted to kind of, like I said, now we want to help 1,000 Muslim millionaires come about inshallah. in the next 10 years, inshallah. So now I've broadened my 
appeal. I told you one of the brothers where in bad times comes out, we might have even signed a deal, alhamdulillah. But we're bringing on a brother, mashallah, who has uh, really got his feet deep in the digital marketing world type of clients that he worked with, Emirates, this, that. We're talking big people, right? So um, to, to give you an idea of, of, the, of, of the level that he's at, I asked him a question. I said, bro, you don't just sign these clients, right? One of the clients that they signed have got three trillion in assets. So I said, bro, let me ask you a question. Don't they have their own marketing departments? So why are they coming to you? Because we're the experts. He said, Emirates Airlines, what's their, what's their expertise? Flying planes, the aviation, airlines. all of that. Right. So at the end of the day, with all the money and the resources, the experience that they have, they are never going to outsmart and outskill a company that every day focuses on just Expertise marketing. on that, yeah. And not just marketing, the company and the team has got the experience of all these international global companies. Mm -hmm. so they want us because they need us. Do you know what I'm saying? So this brother, he also now wants to help Muslim business owners and so on and so forth. And he was just looking for the right platform to do it. Mm. So because we align with the whole Righteous and Rich project that we're doing right now, alhamdulillah, Inshallah, he's going to be providing the education, the support, bringing on people from his team, his staff that lead like global SEO teams and all that kind of stuff to be able to educate Muslims who are young entrepreneurs how you can now scale your business to one million, Inshallah Ta'ala, through best practices used by Emirates Airlines, EMA, Damat Properties. Do you understand? So that's the plan. So, you know, nowadays you hear about all these internet, I don't, I don't, like, I don't like to use the word gurus, but they call them gurus. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, for sure. They might be good and they made money and they're doing their thing. But bro, they haven't scaled Emirates marketing. They haven't done that for all of these other type of... This is, this is, dip, like, this is different level. Right? This is from the, the, the top of the food chain. Yeah, yeah top, so top, top, top. So I really hope Allah gives me tawfiq and we want to bring this knowledge and this type of support and mentorship want to make it accessible for the Muslims. Inshallah. It's definitely not going to be cheap because look at the value. But... Bro, it's not going to be like what Emirates have to pay my man. <laughs> they have to pay my. They have to pay in yeah, yeah, tens yeah. of thousands of meals. Yeah, I told yeah, you. Yeah. I told you. The, yeah. the, one of the companies they gave them a budget of of thirty million for the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying it's not going to be like that. So if Allah gives us tawfiq, man, I'm, I'm I'm trying to put the money in the hands of the practicing brothers. Yeah, different. Because when when you when you've got money and you're practicing, bro, like why why everyone looked at Andrew Tate and became happy when he became Muslim? Because the most famous man in the world said. Allah first mm. So you think Right okay that's deep Let me pray as well Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah fully, fully He influenced a lot of people yeah. He did influence a lot of people Imran to end off this podcast What's the message You want to leave for people Who are watching Till this point Well I man I just hope people They get to know Allah Yeah well I man Just get to know your Lord And have a relationship with him Learn about him Learn about the names And attributes of Allah And then keep that present in mind When you actually pray Inshallah, bro. I'll, uh, I appreciate you coming and joining me on this podcast, bro. Right, it's been a good. wonderful one, bro. It's been a wonderful one. And where, pe where can people find you on socials? You just tap my name, Imran ibn Mansour. I'll pop up on Insta. The Siha Sessions is YouTube. We've got Child Mabai podcast. We've got the Righteous and Rich podcast. I'm about, alhamdulillah. Inshallah. I'm going to leave all the links in the description. Until then, guys, I'll catch you on the next episode of CEO Cast. Peace. <laughs>